everybody, welcome back to the Kotu Center. Baruch Hashem. I hope everyone had a beautiful Purim. Purim in Yerushalayim is out of this world. I don't know if you saw it. It's something totally different. It's a different taste. It's a different light. It's so... It's worlds apart than from the regular world Purim, which is called Purim de Prazot. Purim de Prazot is what the world does on the 14th of Adar. And what we do in Yerushalayim is called Purim de Mukafim, Purim of, of, uh, of Shushan, it's called. Shushan Purim. <coughs> and uh, the Gemara teaches that uh, we institute in memory, so not to forget Eretz Yisrael, so they instituted any city which is walled from the time of Joshua, keeps like Shushan. In other words, in the time of the Shushan, Shushan miracle, Shushan, the city of Shushan in, in Persia, they kept on the 15th, because that's where the miracle took place. Like Esther told the Hashverosh, give us another day to fight the enemies in Shushan so that we can destroy them totally. So the Jews in Shushan were given the 13th, the fast of Esther to fight against the enemies, and the 14th, and then they rested on the 15th. That's why it's called Shushan Purim. But in order to honor Eretz Yisrael, so the, the Chachamim, the rabbis in the Gemara enacted in any city which is walled from the time of Joshua keeps like Shushan. So Yerushalayim, which is walled from the time of Yoshua Benun, because Yerushalayim was a city already in the time that Joshua came in to Eretz Yisrael. So we equate uh, the cities that are, that are connected to Joshua to Shushan Purim. And this makes a connection, believe it or not, between Yoshua and Shushan Purim. And the connection is that the moon on 15th of Adar is a full moon. It's the middle of the month. And the moon is, is, it represents Yoshua, like the Gemara teaches, Pnei Moshe Kifnei Chama, Pnei Yoshua Kifnei Levana, that the face of Moshe is like the face of the sun. It's too bright. Like this week's parsha, parsha Kitisa, the people were scared to look at Moshe Rabbeinu because his face was glowing, was glowing with light. Meaning the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu is like the sun, just like you can't stare at the sun when it's shining at full force at noontime, for example. So what you need is a filter. Who's the filter? The disciple. Joshua, the disciple of Moshe, is the one who filters in, in, uh, in accessible and acceptable morsels to receive the light of Moshe Rabbeinu through the lens, the frame of Yoshua. Because look, the moon has no light of its own. Then when we see the light on the moon, it's basically the moon reflecting the light that it's receiving from the sun. So the same thing, the idea of Moshe and Yoshua, the sun and the moon, that to receive from the tzaddikim, from the, from the teachers, you need to receive from the disciples. The disciples are a main key. And that's, the, that's why Yoshua Dafka was specifically the one who brought the Jews into the Holy Land. He was, in a, in a sense, a continuation a constriction of the light of Moshe Rabbeinu to continue to bring the Jews into the Holy Land. It's as if Moshe Rabbeinu was doing it. That's why the, the Gemara teaches and the, and the prophets also that when Yoshua passed away, only then retroactively did the Jews feel the loss of Moses. They didn't feel when Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, they didn't feel so much the loss. The Torah doesn't make a big story that they mourned and cried over Moshe. For example, compared to Aaron. When Aaron passed away, the Torah makes a big deal, a big story of his passing. Moshe Rabbeinu, something very short and quick and to the point, and no big, big, big story about it. And they explain in the Gemara, it's because Yoshua was still around. And Joshua, Yoshua, was reflecting the light of Moshe Rabbeinu, so the Jews didn't feel that they were an orphaned generation. They had the disciple reflecting the light. And this is the idea now, going back to the idea of Shushan Purim. It's the light of Yoshua. And this makes the taste of you of Shushan Purim, which we experience especially here in Yerushalayim, different, something special, out of this world, unbelievable, mamash. For those who merited to be in Yerushalayim for, for Purim, it was something really special. And for those who haven't yet, yet tasted it, it's something worth investing to get into visit Hashem. Some more insights on Purim. I know we just passed Purim, but it's such a special holiday. Rabbi Nachman says the beginnings now are from Purim, in meaning it's worth investing in this special holiday of Purim and all the mitzvot associated with it, and especially like we've been speaking about these past weeks, the prayer of Purim, the davening, doing your part in asking of Hashem what, what's deep in your heart that's been building up all year round and just swelling up and let it come out on Purim to express what's really bothering you in front of Hashem. It's a special opportune for that and to get prayers answered. So just another idea of the four 
major mitzvot of Purim, and we, we're going to connect it to what we spoke about last week as an extension. There are four mitzvot on Purim, right? Number one is you have to hear the Megillah twice, once at night, once in the, in the day. Number two, the mitzvah of what's called matanot levyonim, giving charity to anyone who asks the poor. And you don't ask questions. Anyone who asks, you give. No questions asked. And then uh, mishloach manot, you give food, two items of food to your friend, your neighbor, you did the mitzvah already. Someone who's a friend of yours to give. And the final mitzvah is to make a seuda, the mishte. And the climax, believe it or not, of the seuda is yes, to get intoxicated. Yes, to drink. These four mitzvot of the what we're, what we're obligated to do on the on the day of Purim connect to the four that we mentioned last week of the four type of people who have to give thanks in life: the ones who who are in the desert, the one who's in jail and comes out, the one who's been deathly ill and after like three days in bed and comes up and comes out of it, and the person who travels by sea and he survives a storm. These are the four that have to give thanks. And we last week we connected it to the four gifts of Purim, Ora, Vesimcha, Sasson, Vikar, the Jews had Ora, light, we said is Torah, that's kind of corresponding to the one who's in the desert, he, he, the Torah gives him light to find direction in life, it's like a GPS to know where to go, that's the Torah, and now the person who's in jail, that's going to get Simcha, that, that's corresponding to Simcha, which the Gemara says is Yom Tov, that a Jew makes the best of life to find the good points, how he can make today a good day, even a person who's constricted, as if to say with obstacles and he, he's like in jail in a way, in a sense that he can't do what he wants to do in life. So that's Yom Tov. And we said the third one is the person who's sick. He can't do anything. You can't expect anything of him. So this he has to be, he has to thank Hashem for a good point that's with him wherever he goes. And even if he can't do anything, and that's what? That I'm not a, that I'm not a, a Goy, that I'm not a Gentile, that I'm a Jew. The, the, the Gemara says, Sasson corresponds to Mila, circumcision, which is the idea of the pact, the bond between the Jewish people and Hashem. Which is what? That the Divine Presence never leaves the Jews, no matter how far they sink in exile, how far a Jew may sink in sin. As soon as a Jew wants to come back to Hashem, Hashem is there waiting for him to pull him up. That's the beauty of being a Jew. We have this bond. No matter what we do, Hashem, by oath, is stuck with us forever. That The Divine Presence is in exile with the Jews, meaning that we can connect to Him. Even with speech, the word milah, circumcision, also means the word. Which is that, that if I can't do anything, I'm locked out, at least a simple word to Hashem to help me to connect to Him. I can't do anything, at least I can talk, say some word. And then the final category, which is the people who are in the sea, where it's a storm, where a person is literally, he, lo he loses his senses. Yalu shamayim yedu teomot. They throw a person up and they throw a person down like in a, a storm. That corresponds to the tefillin, because we said the tefillin corresponds to a higher level of holiness than me a higher mentality, and putting on the tefillin is the idea of attaching oneself to the tzaddikim, who correspond to the tefillin, the idea of the tefillin. By the way, we saw it in the Parsha, something, a beautiful thing in the Parsha, where it talks about B'Tzalel. So Hashem says, I filled B'Tzalel, because Hashem commanded Moshe to appoint B'Tzalel to be the one to build the actual Mishkan, to build the parts, to build the Kaporet, the Parochet, the, the Aron, the Ark, all the parts, all the components, he gave it to Bitzalel, and it says there, Vame I filled him with Chokma, Bina, Ubedat, Ubechol Melacha. Chokma, knowledge, Bina, understanding, Dat, which is the combination of both. Rashid calls it divine inspiration. And then Bechol Melacha, the ability to make all types of work. So these are four. And it says, Amale I fill him with these four. These correspond to the four compartments of the tefillin, both on the head and also on the arm. You have the four sections. So B'tzalel, Hashem is saying, I filled him. And it's idea, the idea is that the tzaddikim are the idea of the tefillin. We have an, a hint here in the parsha regarding B'tzalel and the four that Hashem mentions about him. That's by the way, but this is the idea of the tefillin connected to the tzaddikim, meaning when a person's in a storm, there's nothing. He's out of it. You can't expect anything from him. So it's only the merit of the tzaddikim that can help a person, which is why a person should seek to attach oneself, to come close to tzaddikim, and not to take the, the dry approach of just me and Hashem and the Torah and my art school Gemara, and that's it. I have everything made and said. I'm going to need tzaddikim for those difficult situations where I'm out of it and I need SOS help. This is the idea of the merit of tzaddikim which come to those who attach themselves to them. So these four, believe it or not, are also connected to the four mitzvot of Purim. 
So what are the four mitzvahs? Hearing the Megillah, and, and from hearing the Megillah, literally, at night and at day, is again receiving the Torah from scratch, from anew. We read it at night to receive the light of the Megillah from the perspective of Esther, whose con- is, is, uh, Esther connotes a concealment, Hastara, and that's when it's dark. When you don't see, and there's a concealment, that's reading the Megillah in the darkness, and then in the morning again, we read the Megillah when it's day, when it's light, and this corresponds to receiving the light of the Megillah from the perspective of Mordechai. So we have Mordechai and Esther shining into the reading of the Megillah, and this gives us the instruction of the Torah, the light of the Torah, corresponding to the one who's in the desert. This is the idea of the Megillah. Then, the person who's in jail, and he's all alone, so to fix that, to rectify that, the mitzvah of mata, uh, Mishloach Manot, where friends send food to one another. So you're not alone. You're not a person who's in jail, he feels he's alone. I'm all alone, I can't move around, I'm constricted. The idea of loneliness. So Mishloach Manot is to bring that bond of friendship. You're not alone. You have friends, you have Jewish people who care for you, love you. Look, they're giving you food. Well, he would, if he hated you, he wouldn't give you food. He likes you, right? That's the idea of Yom Tov, okay? And then the third category of the person who's sick, whose mama is knocked out, he has nothing. So this corresponds to the mitzvah of Matanot Levyonim, to give to the poor the Evyon. Evyon is a lower degree of an Ani. There's, there's two words for poverty, a poor person. There's an Ani, which means poor, and an Evyon, which is a lower level. What's an Evyon? He's so broken, shattered, he's so broken, that anything you give him, he'll take. Ta'ev, the word Evyon is in the word Ta'ev. He desires anything you give him. You give him even a bone, a chicken bone, he'll take it. That's how low he's reached. He has nothing. So that's matanot levyonim to the person who's knocked out like he's sick in bed. He can't move. So to get to break that is the mitzvah of matanot levyonim. And finally, the one who's in the sea and he's yalu shamayim yirdu tamod. He's in a sea storm and his brain is not there. That's the mitzvah of eating the meal and getting intoxicated. Where also you're not there. The idea of drinking the wine is to bypass your consciousness and to tap into a higher level of consciousness which is only available on Purim. It's called the light of Mordechai, the light of the tzaddik, which comes about when a person drops his sechel. He puts his brain, his consciousness on the side, and it's just a muna. And that's what the wine on the Purim suda is meant to do, to bypass your control over things, to bypass it, to push it aside, and to let in the light of Mordechai to come in on this holiday. Why? To yes, counter the situations where I'm put in a sea storm, and I can't, I can't handle it, it's above my level, to give me that light to, to guide me when, I, when I'm not there. That's the, that's the light of Mordechai, the light of the tzaddikim, the tefillin, which is, the, which is the, when the person is in a sea storm, and that's the idea of the drinking. So this is again the four, which go back. I know we've already passed Purim, but this is being recorded, so it's for the record for next year, visit Hashem, to know these four ideas. Fine. So now, we passed Purim. This Shabbat is called Shabbat Para. And all this Purim and Para is a preparation to be able to receive Pesach. If you notice, there's a pay here, Purim, and there's a pay this coming Shabbat, Shabbat Para. And then there's also the pay of Pesach. There's something special about this letter Pei. In the Sefer Torah, when you write the letter Pei, the way it's written by the scribe, if you look at the white inside the letter Pei, it forms the letter Bet. There's a Bet hidden in the whiteness in the letter Pei. To show there's a connection between the Pei, which means what? The mouth. The, the mouth and the letter Bet. What's so special about the letter Bet? Hashem chose the letter Bet to begin the Torah with it. Right? It says in the Midrash that when Hashem wanted to write the Torah, so all the 22 letters of the alphabet came before Hashem, use me to create the world. And Hashem in the end chose the letter Bet. There's many reasons given. One is to teach modesty, because Aleph is always, I'm the first, I'm the top. Bet is always to have humility, to always go a step below. But Bet also signifies, you know, that there's two. Hashem is there. Hashem is one. But He wants to give. What is a, what does a king serve if there's no one to receive? So the letter of Bet shows that there's a king and a recipient. There's two. There's only one Hashem, for sure. We don't believe in dualism, chas shalom. There's one God, one Hashem. But for Hashem, to, for there to experience His goodness, if there's no receiver, what does it help? So Hashem, as if to say, created a creation 
in a way, this is the whole paradox of creation, outside of himself, he made what's called in the Kabbalah, Chalala Panui, a vacated space. And in that empty space, he made the creation. Empty, as if to say, void from him, from godliness. So we have the letter Bet to show that idea. Another idea, that there's two worlds. There's this world, which is just a preparation for the next world, which is the real world. So it's the letter Bet also. Fine? So in the letter Pei, you have hidden the letter Bet, which is the secret of the Torah. And what does that do? What is the connection? How do I connect to the Bet, which corresponds to Bereshit, the first letter of the Torah? Through my mouth, the letter Pei. So the Pei is something very special when used properly. And God forbid, when it's not used properly, it can generate what's called anger, divine wrath. Because the, the, when you spell out the letter Pei, you, when I, I pronounce it Pei. When you hear the letter Pei, when you spell it out, it's Pei, Hey, or Pei, Aleph. You can do it either way. So backwards, it becomes Af, Aleph Pei. That when a person doesn't use the faculty of speech properly, which is basically to praise Hashem, to connect Hashem, words of Torah, words of prayer, and on just the opposite, he defiles his speech by speaking bad words, negative words, not praising Hashem, this generates the opposite, af, anger, divine wrath. So the letter pay is very, very special. So now, Haman, he chose this month, and his intention was to bring down the faculty of speech of the Jewish people, to bring them down totally. So it says in the Megillah, Hipil Pur Hi Hagora. It says that Haman cast down the poor, which is the lot. In other words, the lot. He did a lottery, as if to say, to pick which month, to, to choose which month will be the month to destroy the Jews. And it fell on Adar. But the wording is, Hipil Pur. And in the Megillah, the word poor is written without the letter Vav. So it's like Par, Peresh. What's Peresh? There's what's called 280 judgments that have to be have to be mitigated to nullify them and to, to transform them to loving kindness. Or he wanted to lower, to, to cast a lot. It's a, the, the word for cast, he peel, which also means to load lily pull, no fail, to fall. He wanted to bring down the pay, which is speech, joining it the letter resh that creates par. What's the letter resh? Resh this can, can be spelled out resh shin which means poor, another term for poverty, rush, to make poor. So Haman wanted to, to make the Jewish people poor of their faculty of speech. The panic he threw the Jews into, the real purpose was to get them in the feeling of panic that leads to futility and not cry out to Hashem. It was only thanks to Mordechai that he was reminding the Jews, there's still hope, there's still hope. What are you doing sitting down doing nothing? Wake up, cry out to Hashem, move, move your lips, move your lips, talk, talk to Hashem. He did it, he illustrated it. It says in the Megillah, Vayizak Zakak Dola Umbara, he let out a loud cry, a loud scream, Mordechai. He, he initiated the power of speech. It was only him, but, the, but normally, with power's, power, uh, Haman's decree, the Jews couldn't talk anymore. It was par. He peeled poor. He wanted to take the pay and join it to the resh. Okay? So now, through the miracle of Purim, we call the festival, we don't call it the festival of Esther, the festival of Mordechai, we call it Purim, right? We add between the Pei and the Resh, when we pronounce it, we add that letter Vav. The Vav that we put in, in Purim, is as if like a separation between the Pei and the Resh, to cut it. Because Haman, he wanted to make it just Pei and Resh, which means to make the Pei, the speech, weak, rush, to make the Pei, Rush, to make it weak. That's how it's spelled in the Megillah. But then we come along and we write Purim at the end of the Megillah, Purim with a Vav, to show that we've now mitigated it to the miracle of, of, of Purim, which is made basically that prayer works, that Hashem listens to prayer, even in the most desperate situation where there's no hope even above in heaven, in the way, so to speak, they've given up. So Purim teaches that there is hope. So this Vav makes like a wall between the pay and the Rish. What this leads to is the coming up Shabbat, which is called Shabbat Para. To explain, by the way, for those who don't know what, what's happening this Shabbat, we're taking out two Sifri Torah Shabbat morning. One, we're reading the Parsha of the week, which this week is Vayakel Pekude. And then we read a second Parsha talking about the red heifer, Para Aduma. Para is the red heifer. And about the, the whole process that someone who is impure by coming in contact with a dead corpse in the time of the temple, so he's forbidden to enter into the holy temple so long as he does not, does not sprinkled on him the ashes of the red heifer, para aduma. 
So now, to explain a bit deeper, here now, after severing the pay and the resh, the, the hay comes along. What's the hay? The hay now are the five sections of the speech. We spoke about it in these past classes, that the speech, the, uh, the alphabet, is divided into five sections. You have those letters which come from the throat, gutturals, laterals, so there's, there's nice, there's nice uh, fancy terms in English for the, <laughs> for the five parts. You have achaha, which is alef chet, he ein, from the throat. You have gichak, which is from the palate, right? Datlanat is from the, from the tongue. And then zas sharats is from the teeth. And then bumaf is from the lips. I think I got all of them where I mixed them up a little bit. Basically, you have the, the 22 letters broken into five sections, okay? So that's the letter he. He is speech. Also, the Balatanya says something amazing. He says the natural noise of a person breathing is hey, the letter A is in the makeup of a human being's existence. When a person's alive and he's letting out air, inhale and exhale, then you, then you hear the noise hey. When a person is like, is gouging for, uh, for, <coughs> for air, so you hear the letter hey always. The hey is there. That's the secret of the human existence, which is connected directly to speech. So in Shabbat para, because of Purim, so the wording by Rabbi Nachman gives is Mipur Naasa para. From Pur, Pei Vav Resh, originally Hamans, Pei Resh, by putting in the Vav, we make it into Para, where now we want to brush off totally the Resh. Once the Pei has been severed from the Resh, there's no more connection, we add the He to totally wipe out the Resh. The He, speech now, by Jew now coming up, being revived. Purim, just explain that the power of Purim is like an example of someone, God forbid, who's in hospital, and uh, the lifeline goes dead. They, so they give an electric boost to wake him up, to get him back to life. That's what basically Purim does. Purim is a time for re-energizing. Literally, all these myths of the Purim is to do Tchet HaMetim, the res resurrection of the dead. That's the whole idea of Purim. But people who felt so out of it, so depressed, God forbid, so and just unfinished and everything, Purim is now like a boost. All these amazing myths of the Purim, these four that we mentioned, to give a person to start again now. It's a new beginning now. It's a new beginning now to start, and this is the power of porn. So now, with that, the power of speech comes out. What, what, what is reawakened in a person? That my prayer makes a difference, that Hashem listens to my prayers, that I do count, and there are miracles, and that there is hope for me, and I just have to put in my investing, my power, and my, my, my kohot, my strength, into davening, into prayer, into speech. So now that is the idea of para, that someone who's impure, like he's dead, almost dead, and he's in ashes. Specifically, that is what makes pure the person's, the person who feels so low that he's impure, like at the level of a dead person. Because that's what the, I read Heifer's ashes came to purify. Someone who is so impure that he came in contact with a dead corpse, meaning the idea that a person feels literally dead, literally dead. He feels so disconnected to any trace of Yiddishkeit, of emuna, of spirituality. So now, para comes to reawaken that. That's the letter He coming to erase the letter Resh. You have the Pe on one side and the He and they come to destroy the Resh. What's left now is just the letter Pe. So now that's what the idea of Pesach is. What is Pesach? The Arizal says, take the word Pesach and break it to two new words. Pe, Sach. Pe, the mouth, Sach. The word Sach is spelled Samech and Chet, but because Samech and Sin sound the same, so they're interchangeable. So it's as if saying, let your mouth speak. Pe, the mouth, Sach, let it talk. Sach means Lasuach, to speak. Like this is by Yitzhak, by Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Lasuach Basadeh. Yitzhak went out to converse in the fields when Eliezer came with Rivka, the Shiduch, right? The story there that Yitzhak was in the fields davening mincha. So the wording is lasuach basadeh. So Pesach is now where speech comes out totally. And that's really the gift of Pesach. Is that now I can openly express myself. And that's the idea of why the, 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 Megillah, the Megillah that's associated with Pesach is Shira Shirim, Song of Songs. Because this is when a Jew is able to clearly and fully express himself um, on Pesach. Purim is when it becomes reawakened. The person is like jolted, like in the hospital, and he comes back to life. And now this leads to para, 
We have to get rid of that resh. That resh is doing such a problem. And now, what's left is the letter pe, and the pe hey. By the way, pesach pe becomes pe hey from para. The pe and the hey join together after abolishing the resh. So I have now a pe that can talk sach. So this is basically what we're in right now. This period between Purim and Pesach is now preparation to come to Pesach, which is what? The revelation of speech fully. That I can really, really, really express myself fully. And uh, that's why basically they say that in the month of Nisan, the Jews are going to be redeemed. Not just that Mashiach generally will come in Nisan, but also each Jew personally will find that Nisan will be the redemption of their power of speech that a Jew can finally, finally express himself or herself fully before Hashem, this comes out on Pesach. So basically, in short, in a nutshell, this is the whole idea of what we're going through this period of Purim to Pesach, is to enable our faculty of speech, real speech, Dibu Amiti, holy speech, to come out, and that's what we're, we're aiming to get to on Pesach. Because when you have speech, when the Jew is able to express himself fully in prayer, he has everything made. Like Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa said in the Gemara, if I, my prayer comes out clear, then I know that my prayers will be answered. And if my prayers didn't come out clear, so I know my prayers are not going to be answered. That's what Hanina ben Dosa said in the Gemara. So we see that when you have clear prayer, that's the weapon. That's the greatest weapon in creation. Because that's the building block. The letter pay with the letter bet inside. The whole building block of creation. Fine. That's one item I wanted to mention tonight. Another thing in the Parsha. We have amazing things in the Parsha. They look at the Parsha, the golden calf. It's a, a terrible thing. Uh, why is it so terrible? Because the Jews were on such a high level. You saw the, the, the plagues in Egypt. You saw the splitting of the Red Sea. You saw the receiving of the Torah at High Sinai. You saw such an open revelation of Hashem, so clear. And then you do something like this. <laughs> you do something of the golden calf, to, which, which is outright a, a blemish of belief in Hashem. So it's like from one extreme to the next. That's why the punishment is so severe. If there were just nobodies and did it, there's nothing to talk about. But because they had such revelation face to face of Hashem, clearly, it says, this is my God and I will, I, the Jews were able to point at the spring of the Red Sea, even little children, to point and say, this is my God. This is my God and I will praise Him, I will glorify Him. That they say that everyone saw clearly a, 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 a maidservant in the splitting of the Red Sea saw what even Yecheskel the prophet when he had the revelation of the divine chariot which is something big he didn't reach that level he didn't reach that level of what a maidservant saw it was such an open revelation and then to crash like that for sure there was, there was, it, was, it, was a, it was deserving of a severe punishment it's understood so now but what did this lead to? It forced Moshe Rabbeinu to daven with all of his guts, to of all of his effort to save the Jewish people. So what did he do? He mentioned the merit of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Hashem listened to him. Not only did Hashem listen to him, but Hashem revealed to him now a higher level of davening, a higher level of compassion, that until the point of the golden calf did not exist, it wasn't revealed. So as if the sin of the golden calf led for the preparation to reveal a deeper level, a higher level of Hashem's kindness and compassion, which is what? The 13 attributes of mercy, mm -hmm. which Hashem revealed to Moshe Rabbeinu. Like Rashi says on the spot, Moshe Rabbeinu, you mentioned the merit of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, as if to say that if the merit of the ancestors Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov runs out, then nothing can help the Jews. I'm going to teach you now that there exists a higher level of compassion, that whenever it's activated, the Jews don't come back empty-handed. They will always be answered. That's what? Mentioning these 13 attributes of mercy. So Rashi says, the Midrash says, that Hashem showed Moshe Rabbeinu how to dive in. He as if, Kiryachol, he put on a, a talit, Hashem, and he showed Moshe Rabbeinu how to dive in, how to do the 13 attributes, to mention it in prayer. And so what happens in the end? And then you see that this severe sin led to the revelation of a higher level of compassion. That's unbelievable. They sin, they did something terrible. They should be punished and this and that. And yet, it came to reveal a deeper level of revelation of kindness. Because ultimately, ultimately, Hashem's purpose in creation 
of allowing there to be sin and uh, transgression and blemishes is in order to reveal a deeper level of Hashem's compassion. This doesn't mean it's a green light, okay, so why don't just keep on sinning because this will help to bring, to speed up the revelation of Hashem's kindness. That's not it. We do our best not to do that. But when it happens, when the evil has the over, the, the, the upper hand to, to bring us down, we have to seek out to reveal higher levels of kindnesses. But who does that? It's Moshe Rabbeinu. It's funny because in the Torah, it says that Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, Va'ata hanichali, now, Leave me alone and let me destroy the Jews. So Rashi asked the obvious question. <laughs> what, Moshe Rabbeinu was holding back Hashem? He wasn't holding him back. Hashem, Hashem said, okay, Moshe Rabbeinu, let me go, leave me alone. Let me go and let me destroy the Jews. But Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't doing anything. So Rashi brings down the Midrash that Hashem was hinting to Moshe Rabbeinu, if you stop me, you will succeed in stopping me. In other words, Hashem was hinting to Moshe Rabbeinu that you have the ability to prevent me from destroying the Jewish people. Meaning what? It's up to you, Moshe Rabbeinu, to reveal this higher level of compassion, to, to, to forgive the Jews, to stop it from happening. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He did his mission. He told Hashem, if you save the Jews and, and forgive them, and don't blot them out, fine. And if not, then blot me out. And destroy me. You, I, 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 don't want, I don't want to exist. If you're not going to save the Jews, he gave the ultimate level of self-sacrifice for the Am Yisrael, and it worked. And because of all this, and because he mentioned Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, so Hashem revealed this higher level of compassion. So this is an amaz amazing mes message in life, that no matter how low a person falls, mm -hmm. whether intentionally or unintentionally, there's still hope. Why is there still hope? Because Hashem's compassion is endless. And the fall is to prepare for a newer, deeper, greater level of revelation of Hashem's kindness, which until now has not yet been revealed into the world. That's why a person is pushed in a way sometimes to fall in the first place. Hashem, I didn't ask this. I didn't ask to be a sinner. I didn't ask to be born in the jungle. I didn't ask to be like this and not on the improper way of upbringing. I didn't ask for this Hashem. I didn't ask for any of this. I just want to, I, I want to be a good person. That's all. And have all these tendencies and things and all that they blame on, on the upbringing and all these things from the side that pushes a person to be the way they are. And they don't want to be that way. And why is it happening? In order to reveal in the world higher levels of compassion. That's the message that comes out, believe it or not, from this week's parasha. And when a person is thrown down, it's to reveal a greater level of Hashem. And this again is connected to the four who have to give thanks to Hashem. They're thrown into a desert, a spiritual desert. They're thrown into a spiritual prison of depression, of feeling alone, God forbid, of suffering, of suffering inside where a person is just eating and being in, eaten up alive inside, or in a storm. All these situations which bring a person down is to reveal a higher level of compassion if he does the right thing, which is what? Like it says in that Psalm 107, which all these four learned out from, the Psalm and Tell in chapter 107, Va'iz Hashem they cried out to Hashem in their tightness, and Hashem saves them. That, in other words, I'm sent to this down in order to reveal this higher level of the revelation of Hashem, which comes about through my turning to Hashem. This is one of the main highlights of the parsha. Right? It's such one of the biggest, biggest lights. It's unbelievable. Parsha Kitisa, the golden calf, and yet the rectification of the golden calf to the Yud Gimel Midot Shirachamid. Another amazing point in the parsha which goes back to what we spoke about, the idea of fasting, which is the idea of always starting again, is you see at the end of the parasha, when Hashem commands Moshe Rabbeinu, the order of teaching the oral Torah. So it says, that it says there first of all, that Moshe Rabbeinu's face began to glow after the sin of the golden calf, after, after he activated Hashem's forgiveness. And then he had, so that means the first 40 days, Moshe was up in heaven to receive the first tablets. Then he came down, and the tablets were just were broken. And on Yud Zayin Tammuz, Moshe Ben went up again for another 40 days to ask forgiveness. After 40 days, which fell on Rosh Chodesh Elul, Hashem told Moshe Ben, Salachti Kivarecha, I forgive you like you asked. And now prepare for the second tablets, which are higher. Mm -hmm. And he said there's sapphire, a special stone, San Pidion in Hebrew, which he found. And Hashem told Moshe Ben, in your tent under the ground, you'll find there a, uh, what's it called? A, uh, 
a, a, a bedrock under the, under the ground of this special stone, use that to build, construct the second tablets. And on those last 40 days, when Moshe Rabbeinu received this higher, so to speak, Torah of the second tablets, which is a higher level, when he came down on the day of Yom Kippur, so his face was glowing, and the Jews were scared to, to approach him. It was shining this light of the panim, the countenance. And like this, Moshe Rabbeinu taught the Jewish people the Torah. So at the end of the parsha, it goes into the details of how the Torah has to be transmitted. So it says that Moshe Rabbeinu first called in into the tent of meeting Aharon. He taught him the whole Torah. And then, instead of Aharon leaving, Aharon sat to the right of Moshe Rabbeinu. And then came in Aharon's sons, Elazar, Itamar. At the time, Nadav and Aviv were still alive. Nadav and Aviv, Elazar, Itamar, they came in, right? And he taught them the Torah again. So that means Aharon is hearing twice to say, hear, 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 hear the Torah the first time, and he's hearing it a second time, and the children are hearing it for the first time. And then the sons, really it says there, Elazar, Rashi brings on Elazar and Itamar. They also, one goes to the left of Moshe Rabbeinu, one goes to the right of Aharon. And in come the elders, the 70 elders. So now, and, and again, Moshe Rabbeinu teaches again the same idea. So Aaron now hears it three times, the sons twice, and the, the, the elders once. And then finally, the, the whole Jewish nation comes in. And so you see this thing that we mentioned, uh, if you remember, about the idea of fasting, which is always going back to the beginning. If you remember, this idea of spelling out Hashem's name in what's called Achorayim, to going back. You write Yud. And then you, instead of going writing the next letter, K, you do Yud K. And then instead of going ahead, again, going back to the beginning, Yud K Vav, and then Yud K Vav K. It adds up to 72, which is Chesed. But the idea is that this is a certain gematra, a certain uh, expansion of the revelation of Hashem's kindness from His name, which goes forward and then goes back again to the beginning. This is done in order to prevent evil from attaching number one, but also for instilling that the person's faith and moon is always intact. By in Judaism always beginning again, this idea of always starting from scratch, that's the secret of emuna. Of a Jewish, the Jewish people's emuna is that we always are willing to begin again. Every day, every morning is a new beginning. You may have done the greatest accomplishments yesterday, whatever happened yesterday, today is a new day, it's a new beginning. We put filling on in the morning, wake up again, it seems to be routine, but it's a brand new scratch, start, it's not a continuation of the past. And we said this the idea of fasting, I can't go into it now in detail, we went so many times over it, you can hear it on the previous classes, but the idea of always starting again is the idea of always going to the beginning. Because in Judaism we don't believe so much in accomplishment, of getting a, a PhD and becoming an accomplished person. The secret of accomplishment is realizing that I, I, Hashem is endless. As much as I advance, I'm still far. So the secret of advancing is to be willing to start again from zero. You will advance. If you reach 10, to get to 11, I go first to zero and build up to get to 11. And then to get to 12, I go again back to zero. I get, get, that's Judaism. As opposed to the world, you're ready at 11, go to 12. You're ready at 20,000, go to 37. What are you going back to zero? No, that's Judaism. That we want to be what's called chadash, brand new. Old is not good. Rabbi Nachman once said, old is not good. Even an old tzaddik, an old chassid is not good. To be old, which means there's a continuity, yeah, I'm 78 years old, it's all built up. New means I'm brand new today. I remember in 1992, my first year that I went to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. It just opened back then. 1992 was really fresh. Everything was upside down there. No showers, no food, it was crazy. Everything was canned, you had to bring everything yourself. So alive still then was with this famous Rabbi Yisrael Dovodeser. Everyone knows him by now. He's the one who spread this Nanach thing, Nanach, right? But he was a very special man. So I went in to see him on the night before Shoshana. And he's a man, he's 100, he was 103 years old. He wow. passed away at 104. And he had a long life, this man. So I went in to see him, and he was lying <laughs> on the couch. And he was saying nonstop, Ani Chadash, I'm new, I'm new, Ani Chadash. He was saying an old voice, an old man's voice. I'm new, I'm new. I was amazed by that. That, that. To have this in your blood that I'm starting brand new. Not to be old. When a person reaches 50, 60, 70, 80, I'm putting on film today for the first time in my life. I'm doubling for the first time. I'm starting again. Whatever happened, happened. It's a new page. It's a new day in life. That's the secret of Judaism, is to be mitchadesh. 
And why? Because Hashem also is mitchadesh. It says Hashem mitchadesh betuvo bechol yom tamid maaseh bereshit. Hashem always starts a creation anew. So this is the idea of renewal. It's part of Judaism. That's why Hashem wants the revelation of Yud Kivavke to equal Chesed. Because the, the gematria, if you add Yud, which is 10, and then Yud K, which is 15, and then Yud Kivav, that's 10, 5, and then 6, and then finally Yud Kivav K, 26, it adds up to 72, which is the equivalent to Chesed. To reveal Hashem's Chesed, that there should be kindness in the world, it's dependent on you stepping down from your haughtiness to become an accomplished scholar, even in Judaism, accomplished person and everything, to start again at zero. This, doing that, going back to the beginning always, reveals Hashem's Chesed into the world. So now going back to Moshe Rabbeinu, he taught the oral law. It says specifically, this was the way the oral law was revealed by Moshe Rabbeinu. Now what was the oral law that we have? The oral law, the basis of the oral law that we have is the Talmud, the Mishnah. And if you remember, the whole makeup of the Mishnah and the Talmud is everything is with Machloket. Everything is different opinions. Beit Shammai says like this, Beit Hila says like this, Rabbi Huda says like this, and then Rabbi Meir says like this, and Rabbi Yochanan says like this. Everything, the whole structure of the oral Torah is disputes. That's how Moshe Rabbeinu revealed it also, by the way. Every word of the Mishnah and the Talmud is taken from Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how it came. It came in a dispute format. That's the, and, and we said, if you remember the classes, that you have questions in life that in the meantime require a Muna to accept them, but there are questions that are answerable, but in the meantime, I'm not yet at that level to understand the answer, and I have to rely on the Muna. What learning of the Torah will speed up for me to understand these areas in my life? The learning of Halacha, we said. Halacha has a sigula to it. Learning Halacha, Torah law, which means the finalization of the machloket, of the disputes in the Gemara and the Mishnah. Okay, what do we do now? How do we light the Hanukkah candles? How do we do? How do we make the matzahs now? How do we do Purim? All these laws. Okay, what's the final law? I, I'm not going to sit down here and not do nothing because I don't know what to do. Because he says like that, he says like that. No, halacha takes the. It's called halacha psuka, finalization. What to do? Learning halacha, which is the finalization, also inside me clarifies the dispute within me which is covering up the areas of life that I have questions, which are answerable just in the meantime because of my lack of knowledge, I can't figure them out. So halacha speeds up, it's a sigula for coming to understand these areas of life. So Moshe Rabbeinu teaching halacha, look at this halacha now, which is this idea of dispute, which in the, in the meantime is a muna until I can figure it out. And Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu teaching halacha Torah law, use the format of going back. Which is what? We said in this lesson, 62 Likutei Moran, that this idea of always starting again, going back to the beginning, this, this, which is the idea of a fast, which we're not going to go into now because it's long, this is, this is to counter and to strengthen emuna to those questions which are impossible to answer presently. Only in the future, when Mashiach comes, all the deep philosophical questions that people, God forbid, ask, you, you, you can't answer them. Anyone who tries to figure it out with their brain will be trapped. Kol King Shlomo says, anyone who enters that domain will be trapped. Forget about it. You're not going to answer the questions. And even if you find an answer, the answer is very shallow, very light, and the question remains. Even after you have the answer, you're stuck for the rest of your life with these questions. It would have been better that you didn't delve in the first place in these philosophical questions because they bother you for the rest of your life. What to do to counter them? It's this higher level of emunah, which is generated by always starting again in life. When you start again, and you have the power of hitchatshut, what it does, it renews your, your, it renews your emuna, so you can counter these difficult areas of life where there's no answer. Why was there a holocaust? Why this? Why that? You don't have the brain yet to understand these answers. You have to hold on to emuna until you get that, that far. You have to get that emuna, the idea of fasting, which is starting again. Moshe Rabbeinu combined the both to the end of the parasha. He taught halacha, which is to give emuna in the meantime for, for questions that do have answers, but he used together with it the format, like he taught Aharon heard it once, twice, three, four times, Aharon heard it, always going back. You think Aharon was impatient? He wasn't impatient. He was hearing it again, because Aharon, to be Aharon a Kohen, he needed that high level of it starting again. He needed to hear it four times. The sons at a lesser level, three times. The, the, the elders twice. The Jewish people once, they, they don't have the capacity of Aaron or the capacity of the elders or of the sons of Aaron, especially Moshe Rabbeinu, who's the one teaching it four times, right? So it's the combination of both 
gear shifts of the Muna, the teaching of Halacha, which is the, to answer the questions which do have answers, but I have to hold on the Muna in the meantime until I get the answers. And the higher level of questions that have no possible answer, and it's only a Muna, Moshe Rabbeinu joined both of them. And it says again, his face was glowing, right? The Panim. So the Panim, the countenance of Moshe Rabbeinu, reflects also the face of the divine countenance that he received. So in the Panim, we said that there's a gematria, there's, a, there's the spelling out of Yud Ke Vav Ke, what's called Achor, backwards, going back to Yud, Yud Ke, what we said, but there's also a type of expansion of Hashem's name, Yud Ke Vav Ke, in what's called the format of Panim. What's Panim? When I spell out Yud, Yud Vav Dalit, I'm spelling it out fully. K, Hey, Hey, or Hey, Aleph, whatever. Vav, Yud, Vav, Hey, Hey. That, the Gematria of that equals what's called Savea. Savea. It's, 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 it's a satisfaction, satiation. Uh, I didn't explain some points. The, 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 when, when you have Achor, we said that Yud Ke Vav Ke spelled it like that, equals 72. And it's also the name of Hashem, which is the recipient of that, which is Elohim. Also spelled out, going backwards, it yeah, adds up to 200. That was Aleph, Aleph Lamed, Aleph Lamed Hey. It works two ways. There's Yud Ke Vav Ke giving and Elohim receiving to make this, this unification of Hashem and His divine presence, which is with the Jewish people at, at, at present. So this together equals Ra'ev, hunger, the idea of fasting, to activate, the idea of starting again, to, to, to activate this thing of Ra'ev. Moshe Benu's face was Savea was satisfaction, satiation, it was revealing in a full format. This is a bit deep, this point, but I just have to mention it to say that there's a connection in Moshe Rabbeinu's face shining to show the activation of the Panim into the teaching of the Torah in the format of Yud, Yud Ke, Yud Kevav, going back to four times. Just have to mention that point to show this, this connection of these two holy names. What comes out of all this is that we should be zochah, that our emuna should be strengthened, and our speech, the prayer, the idea of Purim, Pesach, because then when you have emuna, the reflection of your emuna is in your prayer. If your emuna is enhanced, automatically your davening is enhanced. You're not, not just reading like we said all these weeks. You're reading it from a sitter a prayer book. You're talking to the sitter. <laughs> the attitude of talking to a sitter. You're no longer talking to a sitter. You're talking to Hashem. When you're saying Baruch Ata Hashem, you're not just reading the words in the sitter and talking, having like a, a monologue with a sitter. Rather, you're now talking to a new food, you're talking to Hashem. What's that dependent on? That the emuna is enhanced. Emuna and speech, prayer are directly related. When your emuna is enhanced through these ideas of starting again, and the idea of always to, uh, of, of looking for Hashem in the darkest situations and be willing to start again then your tefillah is enhanced. We should be zochet to have prayer enhanced, emun enhanced, together to bring Mashiach, Mizit Hashem. Every Jew is required to hear the Megillah twice. Okay. Men, women, and children. This is, a, this is something which every Jew has to connect to. A woman has to hear the Megillah at night, and again during the day. She has to. From the Korsha Megillah. From the Korsha Megillah. Really? Yeah, that's halacha. Uh, the uh, Pesach, you said, can be interchanged with a uh, Sunday <coughs> Samech, when you spell it down. Right, right. Can you, how, do you, how, how is it generally spelled out? <coughs> What's it written in Pesach is Pei Samechet. Okay. But, uh, and and Sach uh, is connected to Lasuach, which is Vasim, as opposed to a Samech. But they're interchangeable because they sound the same. The Sin and the Shin also they come from the same part of the speech, right? It's a shadat, they're from the same, uh, of the five, the five, what's it called, uh, the five uh, sections of the speech, the sin, the samech, and the sin, and the shin, from the same one, zas shadat, which is right, but from the teeth, zas shadat, right? So, well, why are we referring to the sin? Why we to what? To the sin, as opposed to the samech? Because it, it's in the word sach, is hinted the word sach, which means to talk, to converse. Ah. Pe, sach, let your mouth converse, let your mouth speak. To open up speech. Mm -hmm. That's what happens on Pesach. And Sach is spelled? Normally, Vasin Chet. Ah, okay. And Pesach, it's Vasamechet. Ah. But we can interchange the Samech mm -hmm. with the, the Shin. It's able to recognize itself. And this is what happened to Amin. Mm -hmm. He does all these uh, preparations uh, uh, to hurt the Jews and everything. Uh, we'll uh, flips it out. 
But what did he actually recognize in himself that he saw? Because this is how evil would ultimately transform itself. So it recognizes itself and doesn't just delude itself and all others to say that they're good when they're not. He didn't recognize it. His wife did. <laughs> well, it was, his wife won. <laughs> but there was a recognition <laughs> here. Uh, there, there, there is no explicit mention of the recognition of Amman that he did back. He was evil to the very end. Right, he was evil there, he was hung, he didn't, he didn't do tshuva. He was begging for Esther to save him, but it doesn't say that he repented and everything. Uh, it, it, there's no, like he said, it was Zeresh maybe who, who recognized him. But Haman is someone, again, who is Haman? Haman corresponds to the evil part of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. Like it says, that Haman from the Torah, where we learn it from? When Hashem asked Adam Arishon, Hamina Etz, could it be from the tree, from the tree that of, of knowledge which I told you not to eat from, did you eat from? And it's Hamina Etz, from the tree, meaning Haman, his root is in the bad of the tree. However, the Gemara teaches that from the descendants of Haman were those converts who sat learning Torah in Bnei Brak. <laughs> that means Haman had descendants who were not killed, and they eventually converted. They say, I think, I'm not sure, that Rabbi Meir Balanes is one of his descendants, I'm not sure. What? I forget exactly, yeah, one of the big Rabbanim in the Gemara and the Mishnah was a descendant from Haman. Meaning, there was good, which eventually did come out, and in that sense, yes, what you're saying, the recognition of Haman's mistake came out eventually in his offspring. A few generations later, the good, did come out in one of his descendants who converted and was teaching Torah, learning Torah, teaching Torah in Bnei Brak. The Gemara says that. So good came out, even from a Haman. Because again, Haman is rooted in the true knowledge of good and bad. There's bad, but there's also good, right? Haman, it, it says he's rooted in the true knowledge of good and bad. He represents the bad. But it doesn't say that Haman is the bad of the tree of knowledge. It's an admixture. When Hashem came to Adam, did you eat from the tree? When he ate from the fruit of the tree, what's in the fruit? The admixture of good and bad, just the bad overpowered the good, but there's good and bad in it. And Haman is rooted in the tree of knowledge of good and bad, meaning the bad was eradicated. That was the killing of Haman and his 10 sons, but the good eventually did come out in his descendants who were not killed, who survived and came out to recognize Hashem the Torah, the tzaddikim, converted and were teaching and learning Torah in Bnei Brak. Unbelievable. From Haman, from the worst of the worst, came something, some holy spark. So that, mm. yes, is the recognition, if you can sing. Mm. Amazing. Yes. Rabbi Sachs wrote a, recently, um, he was saying, evil for evil's sake, versus the Egyptians, he said, only trying to kill the Jews because they thought the Jews were powerful and they wanted to, but when they saw that they were destroying themselves, then they stopped. Right, right. Versus evil for evil's sake, so. Which is Haman. So that's what I'm wondering. Haman would That Haman, he doesn't care about anything, just, he, Rabbi Nachman, he calls, the, he says there's, a, there's what's called the Frum Rasha. There's a Frum wicked person that he's wicked just for the sake of being wicked. L'shem Shemayim, for the sake of heaven, <laughs> he's called the Frum Rasha, a religious wicked person. That he's, he's wicked for the sake, there's no benefit from it. It's called the Frum Rasha. And that we want to say Haman, and as an extension, Hitler, Yimach Shemam, they were like that, just for the sake of evil, just to just destroy with no benefit, even though they were on the brink of being destroyed, just kill the Jews, kill the Jews. It could be, makes sense. Makes sense. But would he? But how could good come from evil for evil? Because every part of creation, in order to exist, has to have a spark of holiness sustaining it. For anything to exist, even the worst of the worst, for it to exist, it has to be connected somehow to Hashem. What's that connector to Hashem? It's what's called this tiny atom, or this molecule of holiness giving it light. And the deeper the darkness of the evil and the purity, so the stronger this molecule, this atom of Kedusha has to be inside it in order to sustain it. It has to be so covered up and so strong to handle the darkness that it's giving nourishment to. 
So when it becomes exposed, like when you cut a molecule, cut, it makes an atom bomb, so the Kedusha revealed specifically from the darkest scenarios is very high, very high. And that explains the greatness of Bali Tshuva. People who come back to do Tshuva, the Gemara says is greater than even Sadiqim, more, than, greater than even Pekit Sadiqim. Because they're coming from a total darkness, and from there to come back to Hashem, that means the atom, the molecule of Kedusha exploded, and when it reveals, it's revealed big time. It makes this explosion, right? This atom bomb explosion, and that explains from the big, the, what's it called, connection, like a magnet drawing people who wake up to do tshuva, why it's so strong, at least in the beginning. It's like a strong light to show that this level of Kedusha hidden here is so great. Also by David the Melech, who's going to be the descendant of, the, of, the, of Mashiach, will be a descendant of David the Melech. Look at King David's whole life being persecuted and pursued even before he was born. Even before he was born, he was being persecuted. He wasn't supposed to be even in the world. Adam had to give 70 years of his life for this stillborn child, David the Melech, to live. 70 years. He gave him some years. The Gemara says also the Midrash that Ava, Yitzhak, and Yaakov gave him also some of the years they joined in together. It was mainly Adam. And then before he was born, until he was born, his older brothers were born at a time when the rabbi said clear halacha, that a Moabite is not allowed to enter the, is not allowed to enter the Jewish nation, a male, but a female is allowed. And right before David Melech was born, after he was conceived, the rabbis enacted no. It also includes a female Moabite. That means this child, David Melech, is not kosher. So yeah. they're trying to the brothers are trying to make the mother miscarriage. They're trying to bang her in the stomach in order that she should die. Chas He It was being pursued even before he was born. And then look at the roots of David Melech from both sides, Yehuda. With Tamar, such a funny story. And Lot with his daughter, yeah. right? The, the eldest daughter, Moab, right? The whole story of David the Melech is so upside down because specifically from there will come the highest Kedusha. That's the whole story of Mashiach. Or Rabbi Nachman himself said, even Mashiach's parents won't be so high, high, high. <laughs> They won't be the biggest saints in the world. They won't be the big red beard with the long face and the beard that everyone thinks, yeah, for sure he's Mashiach. It's going to be the person that everyone least expected to be. And from there to come, that's when the light of Mashiach will come. Meaning, but this repeats itself in history over and again. The highest levels of Kedusha are specific, specifically the areas that are so dark and so kept down and hidden. That's where the Kedusha is and that's what has to be elevated from. And if people are not doing the job, so like we said in the beginning of class, Hashem purposely throws them into the golden calf in order to reveal the Yud Gimel, 13 attributes of mercy, to yes, activate the revelation of the holiness trapped in these low levels. To get Jews to connect them to those levels, they have to throw in, to be thrown into a golden calf scenario of falling into low levels. After such a high level of Kedusha, yes, they drop you and they throw you to, to, to another world in order for you to call out and while there, to connect to these holy sparks there, and when the Yud Gimel Midot of Rachamim, the 13 attributes of mercy, are activated, to bring back everything. That's how it is. That's how Hashem wants it to be. Everything's concealed. Everything is upside down like that. And that's where the Kedusha specifically comes in. Yes? Yeah, I'd like you to comment on uh, how the story of Purim is really coming around today with the threat from Iran. For sure, for sure. He was <laughs> speaking to uh, Congress and Obama apparently backpedaling a little bit today. And with the Ayatollah <laughs> supposed on his deathbed. I mean, it's, it's a little bit too much here. I just wonder. <laughs> that's, on the, that's on the news level. That's right. We, on, on Purim, we had a joke with the breast of Hasidim that it says in the Megillah that the story of Purim was written in the chronicles of Paras and Madai. So we made a joke that it's written in the chronicles of Paris, Paris, right. and Madai in the media. Madai in the media. That, that specifically the story of Purim is like the French culture, whatever, Paris, where everything's like the France, whatever. And in the media, Hollywood, California, and everything, <coughs> the stars, that this is the, the idea, the story of Purim is everywhere. It's everywhere. You can find connections. I don't have to, to make, you can see the connection. It's, it's obvious. It's obvious. It's very coincidental. It's obvious. Yeah, man. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, not, it's not coincidence. It's a divine providence. It's to show that, yes, the story of Purim is everywhere. It's a funny story. It's a, it's a fairy tale. And it's hidden everywhere in creation. It's unbelievable, the story of Purim. That's why it's so deep.
And that's why, again, the rabbis teach that when Mashiach comes, Purim will continue to exist. No more Pesach, no more Sukkot, no more Shavuot, because everything is in memory of living Egypt. However, Purim, Paris and media, <laughs> Paris and Madai, in other words, the technology, the new world and everything, and America and the culture and everything, how society is advancing, etc., that is connected to the Purim story. And Purim will continue to exist, will continue when Mashiach comes, because it's relevant. It's the same story, the same story of the future of the Jews. Just the characters change. Yeah, exactly. Wait, you mean like. Yeah. Did the Jews will still be persecuted? No, I just like the miracle. Like <laughs> the story, the miracle of Purim will be. The Jews left Egypt, we commemorate Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot in memory of the leaving of Egypt. When Mashiach comes, the, 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 the miracle of Purim will be the holiday to commemorate that day that Mashiach revealed himself. It will be a big revelation, and because Purim, again, the idea of Purim is to reveal God through nature. As opposed to Egypt, living in Egypt, there were all, like we said, there were open miracles. The splitting of the Red Sea, the, the receiving of the Torah Sinai, the ten Makot in Egypt. Who's not going to believe? Purim, Hashem's name is not mentioned even once, and everything, so to speak, is coincidental, right? That Haman walks in, Achashverosh can't sleep, and then Mordechai over here is big time in Terash. The timing is so unbelievable, it seems coincidental, but it's nature covering up Hashem's hand. Anyone who has a brain in their head will see clearly that Hashem is behind the story of Purim. You'll see it clearly. Anyone who has proper lenses, proper glasses, a proper prescription, we'll see Hashem behind the scenes in the Purim story. And that for Hashem is the greatest miracle. To be revealed through the concealment, for Hashem that's the greatest revelation. That people can see God hidden behind the scenes. I see you Hashem, you can't hide from me, I see you clearly. For Hashem that's the greatest accomplishment, as opposed to open miracles like in Egypt. That's why it will be a greater miracle when Mashiach comes, because there won't be a miracle of just stars and, and Star Trek and Star Wars and things flying and this. It won't, that'll be afterwards. Mashiach will come with through nature, through the power of nature. He's going to uh, through the hidden, through the concealment of nature and to reveal Hashem in the world through that. That's the, that's the greatness of Mashiach, and that's the whole miracle of Purim. There's a question in the back, yes. No, I just wanted to comment that it's like interesting because it's like any time in my life where I feel like I've fallen. And then my first thought is like, oh my gosh, like everything was going so great. How could I have made that choice? Because I look back and I think, no, it really wasn't that great. That was just my perspective because now I'm falling and I'm in pain or whatever. It's not really that we keep messing up. It's that Hashem's really constantly opening us up to, to things being better and better and better. And we have to be open to making mistakes and things like that. Right, right. Right, excellent. Yes, there's one more question. Yes. So, yes. Oh, okay, so um, yes. Haman is an Agagite, right? And we were supposed to have, or the Shaul was supposed to have wiped out for all descendants. Right. But he didn't, so we received Haman. Right. And then Haman's <coughs> ten sons were killed. Right. But then that's to say that he's, there are other descendants that remain that wasn't yeah. to wipe out all Haman children. had a few hundred children, not just ten. <laughs> yes, he had a few wives, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> he had a wife every night. <laughs> he had a, the Midrash said, if you look at the Targum on the Midrash, it says he had another 180 sons who fled of wow. Zeresh. Oh. And they became beggars, they were begging from door to door. Yeah. And they lost everything, they lost their status, they fled. And uh, he had a few hundred white children, yes, okay. Haman. Not just th those ten were the top ten. They were the top oh. evil ten, the real bad ones. Mm -hmm. But the, and also, it could be that these ten sons had already children before they were executed. Okay. Those weren't executed. Who says the ten sons were executed? But yeah. maybe Haman's grandchildren from these ten, they were not. There's no proof. Prove it to me that yes, right? There's no explicit statement that they, they didn't have kids before they were executed. Oh, okay. All right. So my question, my question on um, this question would be that, yeah. so we don't know why these particular ten sons were were killed, and also how were they killed? I know they were, they were, they were, they were, they were hung, but, we, but I had heard that that was, a few of us here, yeah. I'd heard that that's actually after they were killed, they were then hung. It exactly. could it could be it could be they were killed. And it makes it make sense because she said Esther requested that they should hang the ten sons 
after being killed. It says that they were killed on the second day, and she said, let them be hung so people should see what happened to them. And the Midrash says, ex explaining how the pole was arranged, that there was like a few hamot, and then there was one sun, the pole continued with an empty space, the second one, and on the very top was Haman. So you had the ten sons under Haman, on the top of one long pole. It was 50 amot long, 50 amot, the, the pole that he wanted to hang Mordechai on, 50 amot is pretty big, it's pretty long, it's pretty high, and it was enough to put in with a space between them, an equal space between them, from the ground, from the, the first one, and etc. It was a space to put all ten, plus Haman on the top. So yes, it seems on the story, how it's illustrated, that they were killed first, however, by sword, whatever, and then they were hung for them, for everyone to see. She requested that they should be hung. Yes, like you said. No, now why those ten? Because these ten were involved in preventing the Jews from the rebuilding of the second temple, which was being started in the time of Korosh, the king right before Ahasuerus. They were, they and their father Haman, they were, they were the messengers to order the the nations in Israel at the time to stop the Jews. There's a proclamation from the king, stop the Jews from continuing the building of the temple. They wanted to stop that from happening. So this was part, this is part of their punishment. That's one of the things, the, the bad things that they did. There was many more things. They also were advisors of Ahasuerus, these ten. They were very, they were close advisors to Ahasuerus. There's many stories. The, the Midrash is beautiful. There's so much on the Midrash, on the story of um, Esther. It's done nicely in English. Uh, in the Mount Lewis, the Torah anthology translated by Rai Kaplan. If you've seen that Torah anthology at the Book of Esther, it's phenomenal. You have all the Midrash in there in a beautiful presentation of the whole story of, uh, of the Medina of Esther. Yes? Can I just, I want to try one more thing. Yes. <laughs> and then I'll quit. But, no, it's okay. okay. To understand the, the miracles of Moshiach yeah. will not be obvious as they were like at the Exodus. Right. They'll be Miracles within nature. So how do we know they're not happening right now? We, we, we are in the time of Mashiach. So, there are miracles happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how would we know there are miracles? And they're, they're, he's going to get the whole world through his power of speech. We spoke about this one. Mashiach's power, he's called Mashiach, because here's another catch. Mashiach and Messiah. We spoke about Pesach. Mashiach is the anointed one. He's anointed because he's the king. But also his power of Mashiach is in Messiah to speak. He's going to get the whole world under his feet by the power of speech. What does that mean? Number one, his power of prayer. But number two, through speech, he's going to break everybody. In other words, Mashiach will be able to have x ray eyes to see right through every person. No one can hide anything from him. The way society works today is each person has clothing, has a physical body, and there's a separation. That means you have no idea what's inside the second person. Mashiach, over his extra eyes, will be able to look through every single person, and all the people who will try to stand in his way will be able to break them by revealing who they really are. How could you, you think you're such a big shot? First of all, he'll speak all the languages. That's another thing. The power of speech will be on Mashiach. There'll be no language, no slang that he won't know. He'll know how to talk to the Arabs on the, on the Temple Mount. He'll know how to talk to the Iranians. He'll know how to talk to Obama. He'll know how to talk to them in France. To every language, he'll know how to talk. And not just to talk like a foreigner, but to talk like one of them and reveal who he really is. You think this, how could you be like this if you did this to your, oh, your wife and you cheated on this and you still you have money hiding in your pillow? I'll show you there's the money hiding here. And you put something, you won't get people, he'll, he'll get everyone cut and they'll try to deny it. And it'll bring proof after proof to cut every person to pieces. Because the whole way society works is as a cover-up. You don't know who I am, I know who you are, and therefore I'm able to scare you because you don't know who I am. Mashiach will know who everyone is, and he's going to open up in the, in the, in the open, and he's going to reveal in the open how people, who they really are, and by doing that, cutting them. Because people will begin to see how sour and how low the big shots in this world are really. All the garbage hiding behind their closet, we're going to bring it out in the open. And by that, I'll cut all the superpowers of the world. This Khomeini, this guy, all the people that are hiding, they think they're big powers, he's going to be able to cut them. And that's at every level. That's on a national level by the Goyim, and even by the Jewish people. The false leaders, like we said last week, is a major impediment for the revelation of Mashiach, is the false Jewish representation in the Jewish people on all levels, whether it's non-affiliated, conservative, reform, orthodox, from, Hasidish, you have false leadership. 
Meaning, they're not allowing for the true tzaddikim to reveal themselves. They're covering them up. They're covering them up. That was the whole idea of Amalek. We'll just go off for one second on this thing. What we read in Zachor. It says by, by Amalek, why Hashem hates Amalek so much, is it says, Vaizanev Becha Kol Anecheshali Macharecha. What did Amalek do? The Jews were kicked out of the cloud of glory, specifically from the tribe of Dan. For whatever they did, they spoke uh, bad, they did certain things. Jews who are, were afflicted with leprosy in, in the desert, so the cloud didn't cover them up. They were kicked out of the heavenly clouds covering the Jews. Kavod, the clouds of glory. So they were out in the open, they were exposed. So Amalek came and killed these Jews. And then it says, Vaizanev. He tailed them. What, what Rashi explains is that he cut off their circumcision. Threw it up heavenwards as if to make fun of Hashem. Hashem, here's your mitzvot. Look at your Jews. Look at what they did. And here they are. But the wording is tail. By Zanev is a tail. So Rav Nossin, the disciple of Rabbi Nachman, explains like this. What does Amalek try to do? The only one who can, white, who can fight Amalek is the one who corresponds to Amalek in the holy level. That's Moshe Rabbeinu. Because Amalek is called who? Rashid Goyim Amalek. He's the leader of the nations. Amalek is the Rashid Goim. He's the first one to come to attack the Jews, to show the world we have nothing to fear. There are nobodies, we can attack them. He's Rashid Goim. Who's facing Amalek and the Jewish people? Moshe Rabbeinu, who's called Rosh B'nai Israel, the head, the leader of the Jewish people. That's Rabbi. Rabbi, Resh, Bet, Yud, stands for Rosh B'nai Israel, the leader of the Jewish people, which is Moshe Rabbeinu. It's called Moshe, our rabbi, Rebbe, Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu. So uh, the only one who can really fight Amalek is the Tzaddik Moshe Rabbeinu. So what does Amalek do to fight against Moshe Rabbeinu? Vaizanev. He takes the tails, people who are really low, and he throws them upwards. He makes them famous. He makes them big dudes, big shots. He makes people who are really small Tzaddikim into big Tzaddikim. He makes them famous. Look at this big rabbi. Go, go get a bracha from him. Go, get, go to this guy. Go, go speak to him. Go do these things. By doing that, he prevents people from going to the real address, to the mm -hmm. Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. That's how Amalek fights against Moshe Rabbeinu in every generation. It's false leadership, even false Jewish leadership. And that prevents Moshe Rabbeinu from doing his job in every generation. Because the Zohar says, the itpashtuta de Moshe bechol dara. The presence of Moshe Benu is in every generation. There is a tzaddik who we don't know. We have to look for him. But there's a tzaddik who is the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu. He represents Moshe Rabbeinu. And Amalek will do everything possible to prevent people from seeing the light of the tzaddik and finding him. And that's done by false Jewish leadership. That's Amalek. That's a main, main impediment. I don't know how we're going to talk about this. I, got, I lost track, but uh, <laughs> Hashem, we should fight Amalek. We should get Amalek blot out, and we should reveal Moshe Rabbeinu, the truth that became Mashiach also is the idea of Moshe Rabbeinu. It should be revealed, Bezat Hashem, in the open, who the true leadership is, Bezat Hashem. Thank you. All right. Shkoyach. Yibav Kei, right? That's in the 10 Psalms. He says there's what's called a Shir Pashut, Kaful, Meshulash, Nerubah. There's a song which is once, then doubled, then tripled, then quadrupled. If you add it up, it equals to 10. You have 1 plus 1, 2, plus 1, 2, 3, plus 1, 2, 3, 4, it's 10. And those are the 10 Psalms making up well, Rabbi Nachman's uh, 10 Tikkun Akal, the, the, it's called the general remedy, if people don't know about it. There's the tech, uh, 10 Psalms which are sifted out of the 150 chapters of Psalms. <coughs> when reciting this specific order, he says they activate what's called this general remedy for even the worst possible transgression, to rectify the damage caused. Tshuva, you still have to do tshuva, but there's rectification of the damage, how to do that. So he says these 10 psalms, just reciting them, activates that. It's like connecting to an atom bomb, the nuclear molecule of all creation is in these 10 chapters. When said in that order, that's it, you create this bomb. It's literally like a bomb, that's what, that, that's what happens in reciting these 10 psalms. But this, for, for people to understand this and accept this requires a lot of more introductions, so a lot of follow-up reading is required in order to understand this much more visitation.
Yes, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> I just really want to know, when you said that the Amalek is trying to prevent uh, the... Uh, true leadership. True leadership. Right. Is that stronger around the time of Purim than any other time of year? Because I've, I've been feeling that. It could be. Because <laughs> that's the, like the Amalek's kind of uh, yeah, it's his, thing. Uh, his build up of, the build-up of Amalek is until Purim night. And that's when he's blotted out. This mitzvah of Purim huh. is to wipe out. Me personally this year, uh -huh. I was... Finished the night of Purim. Finished. I give up. I said that's it, Hashem. I can't hold on anymore in life. I think we're going through life, etc. I was reading the Megillah like a dead person, just listening. But with a belief in Muna, that there's going to be hope. How? I have no idea. But Baruch Hashem, the poor. The, he said once with no sin that he on once on the, the day before Purim, he felt that Haman was that Haman Amalek was standing over him with a rod, about to strike him. Mm -hmm. There was this, this feeling, like you said, about the build-up yeah. of Haman yeah. attacking us up to Purim, and the mitzvot of Purim, especially the drinking on Purim, is to blot out the inyan of Haman Amalek, which is all this pressure that, that there's this darkness, and there's, that's a we're finished, that comes out, that comes to an end on Purim, and it's a new beginning of visitation.